Okay. Okay, it's it's a bit like a cinema seating, but <laughs> let's try it. We'll figure it out uh, by the end of the uh, the first part of the lecture, and then we'll fix it. Okay, so we're going to continue on memory latency today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about energy and power also, touching on some cutting edge research uh, that is just happening actually on all of these areas. These areas I think are critically important, but amazingly there has not been a lot of research in this topic uh, that is done on real devices, as well as improving real devices as we discussed on latency. And energy and power are even worse in my opinion, they're not researched as much even though we need a lot of information related to this. Okay, I didn't put this, so I cannot expect this to communicate without having the USB. Okay, so remember this is what we were talking about. We talked about two major causes of the long memory latency. One is the design of the memory microarchitecture, and the second is the one-size-fits-all approach to latency specification. And we were looking at this stuff over here. So we're going to continue this a little bit more. And this is one slide from uh, last week, if you remember. Basically what we were trying to do is to exploit the heterogeneous reliable operation latency across different things. Things meaning temperatures, chips, parts of a chip, voltage levels. And we wanted to find out and use the lowest latency we can operate memory with. And ideally we would like to do this dynamically, right? And we talked about an approach adaptive latency DRAM that does it static statically. And then we talked about flexible latency DRAM, uh, which actually says, oh, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the chip, uh, so why don't we exploit it? Adaptive latency DRAM there, uh, observes that there's a lot of heterogeneity across different chips, as well as across different temperature levels. Okay, so hopefully these are uh, jogging your memory. And this is where we left off, actually. We talked about this paper that analyzes the latency variation in DRAM chips. And there's more work to be done in this area. Uh, I'm going to go over very quickly one of the works Jeremy and Minesh and Hassan did, actually. And Jeremy just recently presented this at ICCD. And it's nicely called Solar DRAM. I kind of like the name. <laughs> what, what does Solar stand for? Right. Uh, Subarray Optimized Latency Access Reduction. There you go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's good to remember your acronym. <laughs> but after some point, the acronym lives on, right? It's, it doesn't really, uh, people don't remember the, uh, what it stands for. Uh, after some point. Okay, I'm going to give you some key ideas over here, but if you're really interested in this, you should talk with Jeremy and Minesh and Hassan and Girai, who have been doing actually work on latency in general. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things to explore over here. So basically, one of the things that uh, 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 we've observed uh, is uh, there is an interesting spatial distribution of failures in DM. If you reduce the latency, it turns out some subarrays are much weaker than others. I've talked about this before. Uh, uh, in, when I talk about the fly DRAM paper, but some of the experiments that uh, Jeremy and Minesh and Hassan have done showed that, oh, that some subarrays fail a lot more than others. Basically, you can see the different columns. Uh, uh, so, sorry, some, some bit lines actually fail uh, more than others, as you can see. The dark lines are actually the failing ones. Uh, in this case, there's a lot of failures, I think. Uh, but, and this depends on where you, uh, which subarray you're in. So different subarrays have different failure patterns. So the key question is, can you exploit that somehow? Yeah, basically activation failures are highly constrained to local bit lines. Uh, and then the second question that we wanted to answer was, how, uh, okay, let's assume that you've, you've figured out that you can operate uh, some bit line or some row uh, at lower latency. Does this stay the same at least for some amount of time? Meaning maybe, I don't know, 90 days or uh, a few months. And this is one of the studies that is done in the paper that looks at basically the failure probability of uh, uh, a bit line at time t1 and at time t2. And for a various uh, uh, number of times t1s and t2, you can read the paper for more detail. And it turns out the failure probability is very much correlated. So if you test, if you, if you operate this bit line at this latency, at this low latency, at this time, you're, you're not, you're going, uh, without errors, you're not going to get errors uh, in the same bit line if you operate at the same latency uh, at time t2. That's the idea. So uh, this is very interesting. Of course, time t1 and t2 was not years here, so there are no aging effects involved here. That's, uh, that's a subject of further study, actually. That's, we don't know the aging effects in DRAM. What was the ma maximum difference between time t1 and t2? That's Jeremy. Uh, I think it was 
weeks. Two weeks, there you go. So basically, you don't get too much variation in latency uh, uh, within two weeks, with a reliable operation latency within two weeks. And if you want to actually uh, not trust your latencies after two weeks, you can always reprofile, right? We've, we've always been talking about dynamic profiling. Okay, so basically the key conclusion is that a weak bit line is likely to remain weak and a strong bit line is likely to remain strong over time. This is not true for retention, if you remember. We had the variable retention time and retention. As, uh, with variable retention time, pretty much every hour you get a new bit failing. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, do this correlation. So latency is a bit better. Basically, which means that you can rely on a static profile of weak bit lines to determine whether an access will cause failures and maybe you do the dynamic profiling at very long intervals. But you can see that there's more research to be done, especially for aging effects uh, in DRAM and in memories in general. Okay, so the other realization is that uh, write operations, this is actually interesting and this, go, this is probably going to go into the future DRAM standards. Uh, how are write operations affected by reduced TRCD? So if you reduce TRCD, which is the activation latency, uh, uh, how, 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 how does this operate the, uh, affect the write operations? So let's assume that you have weak bit lines over here and you activate and then you do a write. It turns out the writes are okay uh, when, you reduce the significant, uh, when you reduce the TRCD latency because uh, w w while you're sending the data, this thing is still being activated. Does that make sense? So you're activating it, uh, it takes time to uh, sense the data, but if you start the write early before uh, the robot buffer gets acti uh, fully activated, it's okay because the write is going to actually uh, drive the data, that's the new data that's going to be written over here. That's the key idea. Basically, you don't really, really need to know what was there before in that particular area. Okay, and the, uh, the experiments from real LPDDR4 uh, chips show that you can reduce the activation latency by 77% if you're doing writes. You cannot do this on a read because when you do it on a read, you need to ensure that the data over here you get is correct, right? You can reduce it by a little amount as we've discussed before, but not as much as 77%. Okay. So the idea of solar DRAM based on these observations is that you can use a static profile of weak subarray columns. You figure this out somehow, identify them as weak or strong, and you do it with a one-time profiling step, but uh, I believe one-time profiling is usually dangerous, so you may want to do it at very coarse grain uh, dynamic intervals. And there are three components. One is variable latency cache lines, uh, the other is reordered subarray columns, and the third is reduced latency for writes. Let's go over that very, very quickly. I think this is, well, what happened here? I pushed the wrong button. Okay, so variable latency cache lines, what does this mean? Uh, identify cache lines comprised of strong bit lines and access them with low latencies, basically. That's the idea. Basically, what we did at the row level earlier, we are doing it now at the sub array level. These cache lines, you know that they're, uh, they consist of only strong bit lines, so you can access them with reduced uh, TRCD. Makes sense, right? Okay, the other one, reordered sub array columns, this is actually based on some other observation. Uh, which is that uh, when you're actually accessing uh, the zero of cache line in terms of the address space, it turns out uh, whenever you're accessing a row for the first time, the access to the zero uh, cache line in that row is more frequent than access to any other numbered cache lines. I believe 22% of the time you access the zero cache line whenever you open the row in the address layout. Which means that if you actually map the zero cache line to uh, to the strong uh, bit lines over here, you can access it with low latency. That's the key idea over here. We map the cache lines across the DRAM at the memory control level, such that cache line zero will likely map to a strong cache line. Very simple. Of course, this requires some uh, uh, circuitry in the memory control, and you can read the paper for that or talk with Jeremy. And the last one is very obvious, basically. If you can actually reduce the uh, activation latency when you're issuing a write, just do it. Whenever you're issuing a write, uh, whenever you're activating a row and you're going to issue a write, then reduce the TRCD by a significant amount. And you can read the paper, and the paper shows that when you're combining all of these, you gain about 10% uh, performance improvement. Okay, so there's more to do, and if you're really interested in more in this area, that you can talk with uh, me or Jeremy, Minesh, Hassan, and Girai. Any questions? So now you're at the cutting edge, basically. <laughs> There's no more cutting edge beyond this, as far as I know, in terms of latency.
so the, the other question that we asked actually while we were looking at this is why is there spatial la spatial latency variation within a chip? Of course, one obvious answer is because of uh, process variation, right? Random process variation. Some things are weak, some things are strong, and we've already discussed that. But is there something else that is causing the spatial variation? Is there some systematic variation because of the design of the uh, architecture and microarchitecture itself? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is called design-induced variation. This actually happens in many components that are regular. Uh, this is one example here that you've gotten to know and love so far. Uh, basically, this is a subarray again. And if you look at a subarray, there are some cells that you think should be inherently slow, and there are some cells that you, should, you think should be inherently fast. For example, if you're actually closer to the sense amplifiers, you're inherently fast because charge flows very quickly to you, right? Whereas if you're farther away, you're inherently slow. Because you, you need to go through a longer interconnect, clearly. Right? Similarly, on the row side, uh, or across the columns, uh, the distance from the word line driver affects how fast or how slow the cells are. Things that are closer to the word line drivers can be accessed much faster. Things that are farther away from the word line drivers can be accessed, they require longer access times uh, to, to be accessed reliably. And this makes sense because you have a longer interconnect to reach them. Right? So that's the, uh, as you can see, there is a region of memory that's inherently fast because it's close to these sensing uh, and driving structures. And there's a region of memory that's inherently slow because it's far away. Now the key idea over here is uh, maybe you, you can exploit this uh, somehow uh, so that you can reduce the profiling time. So if you know this region, perhaps, then you actually profile only that region and say, OK, this is my minimum uh, latency. Uh, with which you can, I can access DRAM with because this region is anyway the slowest region. And if I just profile this region and figure out the minimum latency, it, it's going to be okay for the other regions. That's the idea over here. It's a very simple idea, as you can see. This is called DIVA, Design Induced Variation Aware Online Profiling. Just figure out that inherently slow region. Let's assume that the DRAM manufacturer provides that to you. And profile only those regions to determine the minimum latency. Now you can actually get rid of a lot of costs and time and profiling, because you don't need to actually waste your time in uh, profiling whether you can access these other strong or uh, cells uh, mm, uh, fast or slow, right? OK, so there's a problem with this, of course, right? Uh, this, this takes into account this design induced variation, but it doesn't take into account whatever we were discussing earlier, which is really the more process uh, variation. So you have some slow cells that happen to be over here. They're slow not because of the distance from the word line driver and the sense amplifier, but they're slow because of the process manufacturing variation. And you can handle them in all of the other ways that we've discussed, uh, perhaps. But this work handles them uh, using ECC, basically. So very, these are very different types of errors, as you can see. Right? This is very systematic errors. They're localized, as you can see. When you reduce the latency, you get errors over here. As a result, they're localized. When you reduce the latency, you get errors over here in these slow cells that are in the inherently fast regions, but they're more random. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're not localized. And whenever you see random errors happening, error correcting codes are a very good way of handling th uh, those errors. So if you have error correction here, you can perhaps fix these errors. Whereas if you have error correction here, you need a lot of error correction to actually fix those errors. So basically, the key idea is to handle these random process variation induced errors due to reduced latency with error correcting codes and everything else with online profiling. That's the idea. So this work uh, figures out the minimum uh, latency with which to operate DRAM with based on this, uh, the inherently slow region, and operates all of the cells by, uh, using that latency. And if there are errors, those errors are handled using these error correcting codes. You can, of course, use the error correcting codes to do the profiling as well to improve uh, the latency with which you can access DRAM, of course. OK, that's the idea. Hopefully, that's clear. Right? It's, it's basically using the principles that we've developed so far. Random errors are better handled with error correcting codes and reduce the profiling overhead as much as possible. And the key thing is you can exploit the systematic structural variation uh, in memory uh, to be able to do that. So what are the benefits? Uh, so these are actually based on newer chips compared to the chips that we had used in adaptive latency DRAM, if you remember. If you remember, adaptive latency DRAM adapts to the temperature variation as well as a cross-chip variation. If you actually do uh, DIVA profiling, uh, you actually get better results. Uh, you can reduce the latencies even more. Part of it is coming from the fact that you're using error-correcting codes, of course. Uh, 
uh, and part of it is coming from the fact that you don't, you're not as much temperature dependent anymore. Okay, I'm not going to go into more detail over here, but there's also some work uh, that it takes advantage of this uh, error patterns uh, and the systematic variation by designing an error correction mechanism that is actually much, uh, slightly better than existing error correction mechanisms. Uh, basically by allocating uh, different uh, bits of the error correcting codes to different parts of the chip uh, in a shuffled way. You can read the paper for more detail of that. Uh, okay, so you can see that basically you can improve the read latencies and write latencies significantly at high temperatures as well using this. And online profiling is actually a better way to handle these things because there are a lot of aging effects and wear out effects that we do not know at this point. These are the things that actually cause manufacturers to put a lot of even more margin to the latencies in DRAM because even they don't know the aging and wear out effects. Uh, and if you do online profiling, you can adapt to those aging and wear out effects. And if, if some cell goes bad for some reason uh, because of aging and wear out, then you can actually increase the latencies to tolerate those aging and wear out effects. Right? Okay. So if you're interested, you can uh, look at this paper. This is, this is one of the uh, state-of-the-art works in online profiling for latency. Okay, let, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, DIVA DRAM. So basically, uh, we can automatically, now we can automatically find the lowest reliable operating latency at, uh, at system runtime, right? But remember, one of the downsides of uh, manufacturers doing this in adaptive latency DRAM was you have uh, production time testing cost. Now you actually uh, remove the burden from the production time and put it into runtime. And if you can actually do this at runtime, it's usually better. Of course, the downside comes with profiling overhead as we will see over here. It reduces latency more than prior methods, especially with ECC. Uh, especially at high temperatures, relying on ECC is very useful, actually, because there is not that much margin in terms of reducing the latency. But if you have ECC and if you use ECC, then at, even at high temperatures, you can reduce latency. And yeah, basically that's the next one. C clearly one disadvantage is you require knowledge of inherently slow regions. So how do you figure that out is a question. Uh, I think if the manufacturer provides it, it's a lot easier. Uh, the manufacturer says, oh, this part of the memory is inherently slow, so you can actually profile it uh, at the memory controller level and figure this out. We'll see if that happens. We need to actually have a much better interface between the memory controller and uh, main memory as we've discussed many times. Uh, there should be information flow from the DRAM chip to the memory controller, but it's not happening right now. I think going forward, it's going to happen uh, more, especially with issues like row hammer. I think manufacturers are providing, for example, how many activates they can tolerate within a chip right now in a special register in the SPD, such that the memory controller can read it, and memory controller actually can use things like probabilistic row activation uh, to, to ensure that it doesn't exceed the number of uh, activations that the chip cannot tolerate as provided by the manufacturer. This is already happening. Uh, so there's al already this interface being, becoming slightly better. It needs to be uh, better, uh, even, even, even more better going into the future, I think. Of course, this requires ECC error correcting codes, but this is already happening. Uh, there are error correcting codes in existing chips, LPDDR chips. They may need to be exposed, again, to the memory controller. They're not today. Uh, and of course, whenever you do online profiling, you impose some uh, runtime overhead. Right? And that overhead needs to be reduced as much as possible. And Minesh gave the talk on Reaper, uh, the lecture on Reaper over here, so you remember that, hopefully. And this is a paper. This actually has a lot of data that I didn't even uh, discuss over here. If you really want to know how a DRAM chip is organized inside this paper, it does a lot of justice to it, a lot of reverse engineering uh, to, of the DRAM chip. Actually, you could figure out this, uh, this, these inherently slow regions by reverse engineering also, right? You could have a memory controller that figures out the structure of the DRAM uh, by reducing the latencies and figuring out systematic parts of DRAM that are actually uh, failing at reduced latencies in a systematic manner. It's not impossible to do this, but of course you don't want to be doing that, right? That's, that's a lot of overhead to re reverse engineer the structure of the DRAM, uh, especially at runtime. <laughs> You could do it one time, whenever you put, put the, put the uh, DIMMs on your system, maybe one time you do it, but then your, pro, uh, your reverse engineering may not be also completely perfect. Right? That's, that's another downside of reverse engineering. But there's a lot of interesting stuff that, that needs to be done in this area. Any questions? I assume everyone understands this really well. People are following, so I can see that. This sounds good. Okay, no questions, we'll continue. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay, so I'm done with the really pure latency at this point. Uh, we've reached the limits of uh, recent research, cutting edge research. There's more to be done and more going, and I think this, this research needs to be done going forward because latency is going to be even more important into the future. I motivated latency. I could actually spend even much more time motivating latency uh, in many different ways, but reducing latency is actually good for uh, performance, energy efficiency and complexity and everything and sustainability in the end because if you have very long latencies that's going to actually make, make it worse for sustainability in the future. Okay, so let's switch to this other interesting things. Now, now there are clearly relationship between latency and reliability but then the next question is can you actually, uh, what is the relationship between voltage and latency and reliability? Now we're going to go three way uh, over here. And I think going forward, things, are, uh, things need to be examined with these multiple dimensions. Uh, voltage, latency, reliability, and refresh maybe, retention, and maybe row hammer. So all of these different mechanisms affect each other maybe somehow. And if you can understand them uh, in a very comprehensive way and model them, maybe you can find correlations between them also. Okay, so basically we've discussed this before. This is just show, uh, putting uh, pictures into the words that I said earlier. Uh, I said that uh, IBM uh, reported that uh, more than 40% of the system power is in DRAM and in GPUs also more than 40% of the system power is in uh, DRAM. So DRAM is going to, uh, is already consuming a lot of power and it's going to consume even more power uh, in the system, especially as we want more DRAM in the system. Okay. So one of the ways of reducing DRAM power is uh, lowering supply voltage. And this is a very powerful way because power is correlated uh, quadratically with supply voltage. Uh, CV square F, if you remember that equation. Power is activity factor times capacitance times voltage square times frequency. And voltage is a very good lever of reducing the power. Now, uh, but, but uh, existing systems actually do this relatively conservatively. For example, uh, DDR3L, low voltage DDR3, reduces voltage from 1.5 volts to 1.35 volts. 10%, which is not bad, but is it the maximum you can do? LPDDR is, of course, lower power to in, uh, inherently to begin with, but there's margin in LPDDR as well. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at that DDR3L, which is one example of lower voltage uh, chip because we, our infrastructure allowed us to test that. Yeah, that's, I already said this, I think. So the key question is, can we reduce DRAM power and energy by further reducing the supply voltage? So what do you want to do? If you have that goal, the first step is, I think, understanding and characterizing the various characteristics of DRAM under reduced voltage. And the next step is, hopefully, based on some understanding, you develop a mechanism that reduces DRAM energy by lowering voltage, assuming if it's, if it's possible. So let's see. Okay, so there are several questions. The key question, one, one of the questions is, how does reducing voltage affect reliability? How does reducing voltage affect latency? Or how, is, uh, uh, how does latency change uh, the, the reliability when you reduce the voltage. Another way of posing that question. And we're going to see that. And how do you design a, DRAM, a new DRAM energy reduction mechanism? So for this, basically, uh, we built an infrastructure where you can adjust the supply voltage to every chip on the same module. And this is based on SoftMC. And if you're really interested, you can talk with folks in the back over there. Uh, but you can read the paper also. Basically, you can adjust the supply voltage to the DRAM modules and you can schedule DRAM commands. And there's a voltage controller now that's appended to SoftMC, uh, which you know well by now. Uh, okay, these are the... Something happened. That's a bit flip somewhere. <laughs> or a connection issue. Okay, basically the, uh, these are the modules that we've tested to understand uh, what happens when we reduce the voltage. Uh, it's a bunch of modules, as you can see, and you can see the dates. You can read the paper for more detail. Basically, what, what, what we can do in the, with the infrastructure is we can iteratively read every bit in the entire chip under a wide range of supply voltage levels. Let's say 1.35 volts to 1.0 volts. So that's 26%. And we're going to see, we're going to draw a graph based on this. And this is the, what the graph is going to look like. This is the supply voltage. This is the nominal voltage in the standard. And this is the fraction of cache lines that, are going to, uh, that we're going to observe errors in. You can see that this is 100% and this is much lower than 100% clearly. And we're going to look at three vendors. And the curve looks like this, basically. As you reduce the supply voltage, clearly you start getting errors at some point, and that point differs for each vendor. We call that minimum voltage, Vmin, without errors, 
And once you go below some voltage level, you get a lot of errors in this vendor, for example, pretty much very close to 100% or 60% of the cache lines actually start experiencing errors very quickly at 1.25 volts, for example. But for some other vendors, you can see a lot of margin in terms of voltage. Basically, these, uh, there, there's a lot of margin put into the voltage so that, uh, again, manufacturers uh, try to be as reliable as possible. Right? But uh, you can see that uh, after some point, you get errors. So this is expected, as you can see. But the curve is very interesting because there is a huge margin, as you can see, uh, between 1.35 and 1.15, even in chips that are not designed for uh, this low volt, even in chips that are designed for low voltage operations. OK, so uh, and if you, if you really want to know what, the, what these error bars are, these are actually different chips from different vendors. So uh, we actually d designed uh, SPICE simulations to actually model that effect also. Uh, then the key question is, what is the relationship between supply voltage and latency? So supply, if you reduce the supply voltage, clearly things are operating more slowly. And maybe you're not uh, giving enough latency, uh, enough, giving enough time uh, for things to settle before you're reading the cache lines. Right? What you could do is, when you reduce the supply voltage, you could increase the latencies also to see if you're still getting errors. Does that make sense? You reduce the supply voltage. You're getting errors. OK, how, how am I going to tolerate those errors? I increase the latencies. My activation latencies are going to be much higher right now. This is an example of activation latency, the blue curve over here. And this is an example of the pre-charge latency. That way, you give more time for things to settle at low voltage. And uh, the curve is expected to be like this. And this is based on a circuit model. Uh, this is what we uh, expect. Basically, this shows the reliable operation latency at different voltage levels. Makes sense, right? As you reduce the voltage level, increase the latency to operate reliably. And this is purely based on a circuit model. Then the key question is, how does it look like uh, on a real system? So you can actually do this experiment on a real system as well. Uh, what we did is we reduced the, late, uh, reduced the voltage uh, and looked at the reliable operation latency, uh, the minimum latency that does not cause errors in the DRAM modules. This graph is a little bit not so easy to read, but once you understand, it's going to be easy to read. Basically, uh, this is one manufacturer we've seen earlier. Uh, this is the measured minimum activate latency that you require such that you don't get errors at this voltage level that's specified by the x-axis value. So for example, at 1.35 uh, uh, volts, 100% of the modules operate uh, correctly if you use an activation latency of 10 nanoseconds over here. And that's, that remains true until you get to 1.125 over here. Well, I guess until you get to 1.10 over here. Uh, at 1.10, some modules start failing. Some mod many modules still operate correctly at 10 nanoseconds. But you need to increase the latency of some modules to 12.5 nanoseconds to operate correctly. And if you further push the voltage to, let's say, 1.05, 20, only 20% 20 of the modules operate correctly at the uh, 10 nanosecond latency. 30% operate correctly at 12.5. And uh, you need to go up to whatever that is. Is that 16? Yeah, you need to go up to 16 uh, for another 10% of the modules to operate correctly. And the remaining modules basically fail. They don't operate correctly, even if you increase the latencies even more. Make sense? So it's very interesting. Uh, and clearly, uh, well, I already explained that. And the lower bound of latency is 2.5 uh, uh, nanoseconds, because the measurement granularity or measurement error is really 2.5 nanoseconds over here. So uh, these modules can potentially operate correctly uh, within this range, but we do not know because our, our RFPGA is not able to measure something that's more finer granularity than 2.5 nanoseconds. Okay, so clearly this figure shows that DRAM requires lower late, longer latency to access data without errors at lower voltage. And this is actually interesting because if you go back to the, this curve that's obtained via SPICE simulations, we get something very similar to that in real life. That's a validation of the models that you have as well, right? Remember, we were looking at simulation. Circuit simulation is no different from architectural simulation in a sense. You always want to validate it. And this is how we can validate it using our own real measurements. OK, so that's one observation, basically. You need to increase the latencies uh, to access data without errors when you reduce the voltage. 
Of course, you could do other things as well, right? You could, in, you could add error correcting codes, for example. But we will see that that may or may not be good. So the other observation is that you get spatial locality of errors. These are different banks um, for a given DRAM chip. Uh, and these are different rows in the bank. Uh, and uh, this is a module that's tested at this voltage level, 12% voltage reduction, as you can see. And you can see that some banks are much more error prone compared to some other banks. You see errors in some banks, but you don't see any error in uh, some other banks. Now, this could be because of some process manufacturing variation, again, in the voltage supply and voltage lines that go to different banks, right? We don't know exactly what's the reason, because we don't know how the voltage distribution happens exactly in, that, in a particular DRAM chip. But you can guess, again. So it could be because of the process manufacturing variation. It could be because of some systematic variation. This is a bit harder to determine. And there's actually more research that could be potentially done in this area. But if you know this somehow, somehow you figure this out, now you could actually operate some banks at lower voltage compared to other banks, right? Assuming you have that circuitry inside. Okay, so these are the experimental observations. I've already said this. Voltage induced errors increase as voltage reduces uh, below V min, minimum reliable operation voltage. Errors exhibit spatial locality and increasing the latency of DRAM operation mitigates, uh, mitigates lower voltage induced errors. So what can you do given this? Uh, maybe one, one thing you could use this is to exploit the trade-off between voltage and latency to reduce energy consumption. So the approach that we're going to take in this work is to reduce DRAM voltage reliably. We're not going to sacrifice reliability. I'm going to talk about sacrificing reliability a little bit later on. Uh, there's a lot of actual potential. If you actually sacrifice reliability and if you can tolerate it in the application, you can do even more, of course. But in this case, we're not going to sacrifice reliability. But uh, because we're not going to sacrifice reliability, we're going to get some performance loss uh, because we need to increase the latencies at lower voltages. And we want to bond that performance loss somehow. So if you actually, uh, uh, what, what does that curve look like? If you actually uh, get the performance loss, what does the performance loss look like at different supply voltages? And this is the curve that you would get. If you reduce supply voltage to 0 0.9, assuming you're actually operating reliably, uh, you actually, uh, hit impact performance significantly. You get a 20% performance loss, even though you may actually save power in DRAM because you're not actually, you don't have a very high voltage. So we don't want this though. We don't want this trade-off, if you will. Clearly there's a trade-off, but we don't want to uh, give up 20% uh, performance to achieve some amount of power savings. We want to control it, basically. Okay, so how do you do that? The idea is very simple. Uh, basically, users specify some performance loss target because you cannot avoid it, clearly, when you reduce the voltage. Uh, and uh, Voltron, that's the idea, it selects the minimum DRAM voltage without violating that target. The key question is, how do you predict the performance loss due to increased latency under low DRAM voltage? And I think there is a lot more work to be done in this area. I actually don't like the mechanism in this paper because it's based on this linear reg regression model. Uh, you can always put, uh, express something as a linear regression model. Basically, the idea is, uh, you have, uh, you, put some, you, you look at some application, an application's characteristics, and you feed them to a model, and you feed the DRAM voltage uh, levels to a model, and the model gives you, predicts the performance loss that you would get if you actually use uh, an application with these characteristics at this voltage level. Of course, voltage levels also correspond to latencies. That's how the linear regression model uh, predicts how much performance loss you would have, right, compared to the nominal voltage. So how do you construct this model? Basically, you need, a, you need a training set and a testing set. Clearly, you need to train this model somehow based on information uh, about applications. Uh, and you can read the paper. It's, not, it's a bit boring, frankly. <laughs> if you actually had a better model for this, I think uh, this would be better. But this is not an easy problem. And then, of course, you predict the performance loss. And you have a tar target performance loss. Uh, and you can determine whether which minimum voltage uh, you should use based on that target performance loss and the predicted performance loss. This is an easy step, right? If your predicted performance loss doesn't exceed the target performance loss, you use that voltage level that produces that predicted performance loss. Okay, then the key question is, well, how do you actually form this regression model? Very quickly, uh, what affects the performance of an application whenever you change the memory latency? There are two things, clearly memory intensity, how frequently you access memory is a part of that. And uh, the memory stall time, amount of uh, time memory requests stall uh, uh, in, inside the CPU. Stall the retirement of instructions, basically. 
again, you can improve the model. These are the two metrics uh, that Kevin uh, came up with, and uh, you can feed this to the model. How do you handle multiple applications? One way of doing it is could, could be predict the performance loss for each application and select the minimum voltage that satisfies the performance target for all applications. Right? This is actually very conservative. Another way of handling multiple applications could be actually by separating them to different memory controllers and using different voltage levels at different memory controllers, clearly. Okay, so there's some prior work that we actually had done uh, together with Intel. If you're interested, you can read that paper. That was a state of the art uh, until this work. Uh, it was published in uh, International Conference on Automat uh, Autonomic Com Computing. Basically, the idea is very simple. You dynamically scale frequency and voltage of the entire DRAM based on the bandwidth demand. If you require a lot of memory bandwidth, don't scale the voltage and frequency. If you require little memory bandwidth, uh, you can scale. Uh, the problem is whenever you actually lower voltage on the peripheral circuitry, uh, that, that decreases the channel frequency. So that's what we did in that work actually, uh, which is not necessarily good, but that was actually better than the state of the art at that point in time. So whenever you actually have low voltage uh, in this off-chip channel, you, you, you have to reduce the frequency of this off-chip channel also. So the idea, uh, the better idea, is to reduce the voltage to only DRAM array without changing the voltage to the peripheral circuitry. So I'll pictorially demonstrate it. You have DRAM array and the peripheral circuitry. You can reduce the voltage over here without affecting the, the frequency over here. Which means that now you can actually get very high bandwidth out of your DRAM even though your arrays would be operating at low voltage. That's the idea. Okay. So you can, read the, you can read this prior work. I, I'm not going to go into that in detail, although if we, if we have time later, we can go into that. So the second key idea over here is to increase the latency only for those DRAM banks that observe errors until low voltage. So there are some banks, as I discussed earlier, uh, that require high latency because they are, they are failing when they're operated at low voltage, but many other banks can be operated at low latency. So basically be bank aware in doing this. So clearly the benefit is these banks provide you high performance uh, even though you reduce the voltage, and only this bank provides you low performance. So that we're basically, as you can see, adding more heterogeneity uh, into the voltage uh, as well as, uh, well, not into the voltage. In this case, uh, it's, it's just latency. We're operating everything at the uh, low voltage over here. Okay, so then this is evaluated with some simulator, uh, as you can see, emulator, and then uh, compared to the prior work that I just described. What are the results? You can read the paper for more detail. Basically, the results show that if your memory intensity is low, then you actually save uh, some amount of power. But of course, uh, uh, in this case, it's energy savings. And this is across the entire system, CPU plus DRAM. You save some amount of energy, but of course, your energy savings is low because you're not accessing memory a lot as a result. Uh, that's not a big part of your memory latency, uh, memory access. If your memory intensity is high, then the energy savings across the entire system is relatively high. It's 7% which is the entire system, which is not bad. Uh, because you're accessing memory a lot, and memory is a bigger power uh, consumer in the system. And compared to prior work, as you can see, the savings is even better at high uh, intensities, because what happens is, if you're actually at high intensity, you need a lot of memory bandwidth demand. And remember, the prior work actually scales voltage and frequency based on the memory bandwidth demand. If your memory bandwidth demand is high, it doesn't scale the voltage and frequency. Uh, to be lower, as a result, it, you don't save as much. In this case, because uh, even, even when we reduce the voltage, uh, memory bandwidth is remaining the same because of what I just showed you over here. You can still operate the peripheral circuit at high frequency and we're reducing the voltage only into the arrays. As a result, you can still have high bandwidth at high intensity and still get a lot of benefit, uh, energy reduction benefit because you're reducing the voltage. That's the idea over here. Okay. So what about performance? Performance side, of course, we're going to give up some performance. And these are the, this is the performance loss that you get on average uh, at, across low and high memory intensity applications for Voltron. It's basically about 1.5 to 2%. And the maximum performance loss is actually about 3.2%. You can find that in the paper. And the performance target that was set for this work was up to actually 5% performance loss. So it's not a bad trade-off. Basically, you, you give up some performance uh, to save, hopefully, a, a lot more system energy. If you can break that barrier uh, trade-off, that would be even better, meaning get high performance as well as high energy, uh, high energy reduction. But it's not very easy to do that, I think, if you want to maintain reliability of every single access. Okay, any questions? <laughs> 
uh, giving you a lot of interesting data, I think, that you can consume maybe. Okay, so let's talk about this approach, what's the advantage and disadvantage. Now actually, we have a new uh, trade-off, which is you can trade off between voltage and latency to improve energy and performance while keeping things reliable. Uh, and you can exploit the high voltage margin present in the year. Right? Uh, basically, there will always be some voltage margin that's put into any products. And uh, actually, processors are already exploiting that voltage margin with dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. And we need to do it in memory also. Disadvantage, of course, now always you have higher testing costs. Whenever you, find, whenever you need to find the reliable operating X, latency, voltage, whatever you're dealing with for each chip. And this also increases the higher testing cost as well. Then the key question is how, who does it, again, comes into play. But there is not enough work to understand who should do this at this point. It could be, the, again, the DRM manufacturer. It could be the memory controller. But it's not clear what are the trade-offs at this point. But if you're interested in this, you can take a look at this paper. OK. I've alluded to this, and, but never asked the uh, mm, question. But if, what if we can actually sacrifice reliability of some data to access it with even lower latency? What can that enable? Uh, and I'm not going to give an answer to this question, but hopefully some of you might do some works in this area. I think there's a lot of potential over here. If you can sacrifice the reliability of some data because the application can tolerate that reliability loss because at the algorithmic level, then you can do a lot more, I think. Uh, you can be a lot more aggressive in your latency reductions, and you can map your data uh, intelligently such that maybe reliable portions, uh, the portions of your data that require reliability don't get affected as much, whereas portions of your data that don't require as much reliability can be affected, but you don't care as much. Right. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot more to, to be done in this area so that I can fill more slides over here. <laughs> okay. Let's see where we are. I think, I think I'll finish latency and then we'll take a break. I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot more actually. I'm just going to uh, flash some things. So you can actually similarly reduce refresh latency. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, but you can exploit similar ideas to reduce the refresh latency. And you can take a look at the paper, this paper for some analysis. And Jeremy already talked about other things that you can do if you understand latency really well. Right? We had this lecture where Jeremy talked about the, the creating a physical unclonable function. Uh, based on reducing latency and exploiting the error patterns that are unique to the device as a result of that. So I think this is very interesting. Going forward, uh, there's work that, uh, again, Jeremy is doing that's under submission uh, that generates random numbers this way. You can actually generate random numbers whenever you reduce latency. And the error patterns that come about uh, because of the reduced latency can lead to essentially true random numbers uh, that's a true random number generator inside the DRAM itself. So the understanding that we've built so far in this course and the research actually leads to really, really interesting things like that. Uh, and once you actually can generate true random numbers inside DRAM at high throughput, which is actually really interesting because you don't need to change much in the system. People today, if they want random number generators uh, for strong cryptographic applications, what they do is they actually create these random number generators some of them are pseudo-random. Pseudo-random is usually not good because you always have the uh, possibility that somebody can break it. Pseudo-random number generators are usually based on these linear feedback shift registers. You actually try to have, you build a shift register that gives you random enough numbers uh, by putting enough randomness. There are also true random number generators that exploit stuff inside the chip, for example, uh, variations inside the chip. But they actually come at a high cost. Whereas if you do it inside the DRAM, uh, you can actually get it almost for free because you're just changing the latencies in the memory controller. Right? Of course, there's some overhead because whenever you need to generate a random number, uh, you need to access a portion of the DRAM with reduced latency and you need to do some post-processing after that. But that overhead is hopefully minimal because you don't need to create a very specialized circuitry. Then the key question is after, after you have the random numbers inside DRAM, what else can this enable? So it's good to think about these directions. And uh, I always, uh, it's always good to look back in research also. If we actually hadn't done all of this research and the inf uh, built that infrastructure that enabled us to actually understand these things, we would never get to this point where you could generate random numbers in the year. Right? Okay. Any questions? That sounds like fun, right? 
It's actually, there are really interesting other things that could potentially uh, be enabled. If you actually have a true random number generator, that actually affects quantum computing really interestingly uh, from, uh, from my perspective. But we don't need to go into quantum computing right now. Yes? Uh, just a comment. It sounds sure. like uh, it would be very easy to implement the backdoor for the manufacturer if, you, if your random numbers come from uh, variation in the DRAM chip. Because nobody really knows what uh, the variation is. It could be. Yeah, but, but the manufacturer doesn't know it also. Yeah, but he could know it if he wants to implement specifically, uh, specifically a backdoor. Mm, what, what do you mean? Uh, like, how would. If your random numbers are from an algorithm that's publicly known, then it's, it's difficult, or it could be broken, but. Uh, you might uh, it might go public and then you know the algorithm. Basically, mm -hmm. you know what's happening, how how your numbers are generated. But uh -huh. if they come from variation in the DRAM chip, uh -huh. then you don't really know. But That's right. if the manufacturer wanted to uh, mess with mess with mess with your random numbers, uh -huh. they could specifically um, doctor the, the DRAM chip so uh -huh. that your variation is not actually variation, but so that's a, that's a very good point. I'm not sure if anyone ha knows how to do that at this point. Okay. If you can somehow mess with true random number, so basically they would be messing with some true number, random number generator. Uh, yeah, they would be messing. Because this is really not uh, pseudo-random, right? Yeah, but uh, so you're saying it's, it's not really possible at this stage to... Uh, as far as I know, yes. ...mess with the, late, with, with the, the manufacturing data. Exactly, exactly. Not at that level, yeah. Because the, the process manufacturing, this, really, this is really relying on the process ma manufacturing, uh, uh, process variations due to manufacturing. And DRM manufacturers have really no control over that okay. at this point. Uh, so it's not just like a cost thing that there, these errors exist. Exactly, exactly. It's not just a cost thing, yeah. yeah it's, it's fundamentally there. <laughs> yeah. But that's a very good way of thinking, I think. It's always good to think like, can you actually break this in some way? <laughs> Especially in security, it's really a good way of thinking. Whenever there's a new proposal, it's always good to think, can I break it somehow? <laughs> okay, uh, but this is not about random numbers, as you can see, the random number is uh, still in works. And if you're really interested, you can talk to Jeremy uh, and Minesh uh, and Hassan, who are basically the same authors over here. Okay, uh, okay there's, of course, there are other ways of reducing memory latency. One way is exploiting memory access patterns, and you already heard about this from Hassan. Uh, the idea was charge cache. If, if your memory access patterns are such that uh, you've recently activated a row and you need to activate that row again, you can take advantage of that. Uh, in, uh, and reducing the activation latency for the second time, you need to activate that row. And you know this idea very well. This is not, e this is not possible to do in existing DRAM chips uh, today, but DRAM, because there is some self-timing in DRAM where you cannot reduce the uh, uh, latencies that much, but you can actually uh, do it going forward, I believe. Okay, there's also a very recent work that was presented very recently uh, at Micro, actually just a couple of days ago, which I'm not going to go into. If you're really interested, and again, you can, uh, you can talk to the usual suspects <laughs> in my group who are working on DRAM. Uh, Okay, I don't want to go into it in detail. But basically, one of the things that this is exploiting is uh, uh, activation latency reduction, but it's also exploiting uh, the idea of restoration latency reduction. I talked about restoration latency reduction, right? You can reduce the restoration latency uh, uh, if you actually uh, know the charge level. Um, actually, ALDM, adaptive latency DRAM, did that. It, at, at low temperatures, uh, you can reduce the restoration latency by doing partial restoration, right? Now, you can actually do partial restoration more intelligently if you know that you're going to access uh, that, that particular row again very soon. And that's the idea over here. If you know that you're going to access a row soon, don't restore the charge as much. Restore the charge just enough that you can read the row correctly. Then the question is how do you do that and how do you do that in, uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, reducing the activation latency of a row. Okay. Okay, this is a summary, basically, low latency memory. We've looked at a lot of approaches. Some of the other things that I, that I just described don't fit fully over here, actually. Uh, although they do kind of fit to the one-size-fits-all approach in general. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, we have two major reasons. 
because of, uh, for low latency, uh, for long memory latencies, one is the design of the microarchitecture of DRAM. There needs to be more work in that area also. And we've covered a bunch of ideas over here. And the second is the one size fits all approach to the latency specification. And I think actually the charge cache and the partial restoration, all of them actually fits into this reason also. Now, except maybe there should be access patterns over here. I'm going to update these slides for the next generation. <laughs> It should really include the access. Same, we, we have same latency parameters for all access patterns today, but that, should, that doesn't need to be the case. OK, so this is one challenge that we've been covering. Let me talk a little bit about the um, power consumption, uh, and then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to jump into processing in memory. Power consumption is very interesting, and if you're really interested, you should talk to Girai in the back about it, because he did a lot of work in this power measurement platform, right? Yeah, he's nodding his head over there. Uh, so, uh, and this is something that very little has been done uh, until this paper that I'm going to describe. Basically, this is the power measurement infrastructure that we built uh, using our FPGA-based infrastructure. It took a lot of time to get it right. It took more than a year to definitely get it right. Girai was not the first person who started this. Uh, actually, it took probably more than, uh, around two years to get it really right. Uh, and if you're really interested, talk with Girai and other people who are involved. Uh, and we wanted to measure current consumed by a module uh, during a soft MC test, basically. And we did that. Of course, it took a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears with the infrastructure development, which always takes with real infrastructures. Uh, and based on that, we did actually perform some tests. So what are those tests? Basically, for some number of modules, as usual, uh, you test, uh, uh, essentially, what is the current consumed. So I'm going to give you summary results very quickly. It's not going to take a lot of time. I'm not sure why there should be a better way of doing this. Whenever I copy paste slides, this is what happens. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> maybe somebody can figure out that, uh, tell, tell PowerPoint that uh, it should adjust this part also. <laughs> it's adjusting the page number, but it's not adjusting this part over here. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so this is basically uh, some of the results. Uh, basically, we wanted to understand uh, so DRAM manufacturers, actually, if you want to know the DRAM power today, uh, there are a few models. And the models are usually, you can of course develop a circuit level model, uh, but those are not necessarily fully accurate. Or you can rely on the data sheets. And the data sheets, DRAM manufacturers basically give you a power number. And they say, okay, this is, for example, the idle current consumed by DRAM if you're doing nothing. Everything is idle. And basically, it's uh, 90 milliamps, according to this manufacturer's a particular DRAM sheet. Right? So that's what you get. The key question is, how accurate is this? Is it really 90 milliamps? Is it really 90 milliamps uh, under all conditions? Right? And that's what we wanted to understand over here. So we measured the power consumption, and this is what you get. Basically, these are measured consumption under some conditions, of course. right? Not under, not under all conditions, clearly. So it turns out, in these conditions, the different vendors have very different margins. And there is a margin. So for example, uh, for this uh, current, uh, we see that uh, it's about 30, 30 to 40 milliamps, as opposed to the 90 milliamps shown by the manufacturer. Maybe there's a huge guard band that the manufacturer puts. Maybe it's because of the temperature. Um, so we don't know exactly where that guard band is fully coming from, but there's clearly a guard band under these conditions. And that's true for all manufacturers, as you can see. It's different for different manufacturers. And that's true for different currents. This is the activate precharge current, IDD0. That's another current that's reported by the manufacturers. You can see that there's a huge margin. And there's some margin in the read current, as you can see. Uh, and there's low variance among different modules of the same vendor. Uh, if you can see that the, this is a variance across different modules of the same vendor, it's not a lot. So that's one observation. The conclusion is that current consumed by real DRAM modules varies significantly for uh, the IDD values uh, that we measure that are report, uh, compared to those that are reported by the data sheets. This could be interesting, but there needs to be more understanding of this. You can read the paper. Uh, but there, I think even beyond the paper, there needs to be a lot more understanding to be developed. Where is this margin coming from? How, uh, uh, how does temperature and how, does different, how do different things affect these margins? The second thing that's interesting over here is, which shouldn't be obvious by now, because everything is dependent on the data patterns, as you can see, is DM powers depend on data values. Uh, you can read the paper for the reasons in more detail, but basically uh, you can see significant difference. Uh, this is the number of ones in a cache line, cache block, and this is when, you, uh, when you're reading the cache block and when you're writing the cache block. You can see that it's, uh, there, there's a variation uh, in the current that we measure. If you're writing zero ones, 
the current is low. If you're, if, you're, if you're reading zero once, the current is low. If you're reading 512 ones in the cache line, then the current is pretty high. And this is consistent across different vendors, as you can see. So there's a clear data pattern de uh, uh, dependence. And again, you can read the paper for more detail. There needs to be more analysis over here. You can talk to Girai as well. OK, uh, also there's structural variation, as expected, again, based on what we've seen. Uh, this is uh, the variation in idle current across different banks. You can see there's significant variation in vendor C. There's normalized idle current. Vendor B and vendor A may not be that affected in this particular case. But they're affected by variation uh, in read current across different banks. And also write current. You can read the paper for more detail. And this is, the num uh, this is basically the variation based on the row address bits. So there's interesting variation patterns that we don't fully understand as well at this point. Uh, so there needs to be more research to be done in this area. So again, as expected, there are significant structural variation. DRAM power varies systematically by bank and row. And maybe you can take advantage of these things, right? Uh, maybe you can actually take advantage of the fact that some banks are lower power to access inherently with. And if you're really frequently accessing a particular bank, you use those banks. Uh, if you have particular pieces of data, you put those data into those banks. OK, this is very interesting, I think. Maybe this is the most interesting concrete uh, thing that you can empathize with. Basically, this is, uh, these are the data sheet values that the DRM manufacturers uh, provide over generations from 2011 to 2015. So there is a huge reduction in power according to the data sheet values. But this is what we measured in real life. So the re there is a reduction, no question about that. But the reduction is not as large as that is advertised in the data sheet values. So maybe the reduction is coming from the reduction of the huge margin uh, that is put into the data sheet values to begin with, and not from any, uh, any significant architectural change. So they're, they're into, of course, we can, only, uh, we can only guess at this point, because we don't know where, the, where, where these data sheet values actually really come from as well. OK, so that's interesting. Uh, so basically, you have similar trends for other currents as well. Uh, and this is true for the right current, as you can see. This is the reduction that you see, and this is uh, what we see in real. So basically, actual power savings of newer DRAM is much lower than the savings indicated in data sheets. It, this, is, this directly translates to, if you're doing your power calculations based on those data sheet values, maybe getting a, a new DRAM isn't getting you a lot of benefit in terms of power. OK, you can, you can read this the, uh, in the paper. This is the summary of everything that I just said. OK, then the key question is, if you, if you know all of this, what, what, what else can you do? So this paper actually uh, provides Vampire. It's a, <laughs> I like this name, <laughs> although Vampire is probably aliasing with many other names. If you search for Vampire DM, maybe you'll be able to find this. But uh, it's a variation of our model of memory power, basically. Uh, the inputs, uh, it's, a, it's a new power model. Uh, and I'm illustrating this because if you actually have all of these measurements, it's good to do useful, uh, something useful with it. And providing a power model is actually a very useful thing, as we will see, because people can actually use this and hopefully generate much more reliable uh, power consumption numbers. So the inputs are coming from a memory system simulator. You can actually get traces of DRAM commands and timing and data that's being written, because clearly the data pattern affects your power significantly. You input that to Vampire. Vampire does reads and writes and data-dependent power modeling and different types of current power modeling and structural variation of our power modeling based on the real life results that we've seen and outputs per vendor power consumption and some range for each vendor. And you can actually download this now and use it. If you're really interested in it, you can actually do projects with it also. So the key question is how accurate is it compared to uh, existing models? So existing models, as I said, usually use either data sheets or some sort of circuit uh, level measurements. Uh, or sim uh, simulation, as well as data sheets. And you can see that uh, they're relatively inaccurate, especially the data sheet values are not very accurate. But even the other ones are not very accurate. So Vampire is relatively accurate uh, compared to the other modules, of, uh, the, uh, the, the other models. Uh, but of course, its real accuracy is to be tested uh, going forward, right? These are, if you, if you, this is the accuracy that we test based on our own knowledge. But going forward, as people use it, uh, the, its accuracy will be put to real test. And also, things can improve, as you can see, uh, once you actually test newer things. OK. OK, so uh, now that you have this power model, what can you do with uh, 
the power model as well as the observations. And the paper actually has some detail on this, but not a lot. Uh, there is a lot more open work in this area. Can you take advantage of, for example, the structural variation to perform variation-aware physical page allocation to reduce power? I just said this earlier, right? If you're accessing some page very frequently, maybe you should put it to a low power bank. The paper doesn't look at that a lot, uh, but there's more work, as I said, in this area to be done. Uh, maybe you can do better power down scheduling in DRAM, again. Uh, the, one, one of the things that the paper studies is uh, looking at different cache line encodings. How do you encode the data in a cache block uh, in a way that reduces power whenever you do read and writes, for example. Maybe you can reduce the number of, write, uh, uh, number of ones, for example, right, in the cache line. And actually, there is, uh, there is a study of uh, data dependency where cache line encodings, so I'll refer you to the paper. But that basically, this study shows that uh, using uh, the encoding that's proposed, uh, you can actually reduce uh, DRAM energy by about 12%. And that is enabled, again, by uh, the observations as well as the power model uh, that's provided in the paper. So this is an example use case of the power model. You can develop better encodings. But you can also do these things. But there is a wide open area because this is the first as far as I know, this is really the first experimental uh, uh, approach to understanding DRAM power as well as modeling it. Experimental meaning experimental based on real devices, right? Because experiments could be based on circuit simulation too. Okay. Okay, so if you're interested in this, this is really hot off the press, <laughs> literally. Uh, it's going to be published in December uh, in, in, in this, uh, well, it's, it's already presented, but the, the full paper is officially published in December, but you can, you can find it online on my webpage. Okay, so I've talked about power, but this is the end of the lecture. So we should really be looking at more low latency as well, low energy and low power architectures. And these are actually really interesting things, but we're also going to talk about an orthogonal approach uh, to fundamentally reduce latency and energy, and that's going to be processing in memory. And we're going to start that after a break. Any questions before we take that break? Okay, so let's take a break for 15 minutes and then we'll start with processing in memory. <laughs> 